agree with Alan Greenspan, we ought to just eliminate the debt ceiling. Oh, absolutely. We do. The ability of almost every working American to access more credit than they should have been able to masked the underlying fact that lower and middle class incomes were not rising. That's not a tenable strategy. Isn't that the time to eliminate it? Oh, we've been time a long time ago. Let's put aside terrorism. Let's talk only about our own homegrown animals that are patrolling America right now. So it goes down to the simplest thing. Be prepared, be vigilant. Ah, my beautiful I Am Liberty audience, how are you? This day couldn't really get any better unless I hopped on an episode of the I Am Liberty show, right? Unless I jumped on putting one of these out. This has been a tremendous day for many reasons. But before we get into life about me, I do want to applaud North and South Korea for coming together and doing their thing. We had a glimpse of peace there. Who knows what comes of it? But listen to me, we had a glimpse of peace from the North and the South. And this is monumental. Because this stuff affects you on a very real, very personal level. You know how I know it affects you? Let me tell you. Because I made lots of money off of off of the madman from North Korea. I made lots of money and got lots of exposure because he was he was doing dangerous things and and when dictators and maniacs do dangerous things, people go to prepper websites. Prepper website webmasters come to me and say I need articles about an EMP. I would need books about how to survive a nuclear bomb. I need this, I need that. And you know what? I oblige. But I also take away from that, right? I take away from that. I take away this idea that peace, peace means something. Peace has an effect. If the threats have an effect, then the peace must have an effect. The money's good, but guess what? I'm dynamic enough that I can make it anyway, right? I can make it in many different ways. I don't need to scare people to death to do it. And I think that's pretty evident, right? You, you, if you go to my website, there's very little fear tactics there. You know, you go to the I Am Liberty Show website. If you don't, you really should. You go to the landing pages. You go to the, the you know, the free offers, the blogs, the all of that. It's very rare that I have one out there that's like, we're all going to die. You need a bunker. You're going to die. I'm going to die. We're all going to die. Everyone's going to die. And you need to find, <laughs> you need to find a place to hide. You need these seven skills or else you won't... Listen, it's my bread and butter. I'm not going to make fun of it. I have a lot of people who pay me good money to to write articles like that. And the truth of the matter is, there's nothing wrong with that either. Right? Because people want to know this stuff. Listen, prepping is a journey. I talked to Shelby Gallagher about this on my live show last Wednesday. Prepping is a serious journey. It is maybe one of the most worthwhile journeys that I've ever been on. Angling. Angling is by far the greatest journey a man can take. I don't care what you say. Hunting. You can say what you want about hunting. Listen. You can say what you want about hunting. Hunting is cool. Hunting is amazing because it provides you with so much damn food. But I'm going to tell you this much about angling. Angling puts you in touch with nature in a way that hunting cannot. I'm just telling you how it is. You know, I've had to come to a very clear decision about what hunting and what fishing is to me. And and hunting is a very different animal than fishing when it comes to how much I like it and how often I'll do it. But anyhow... I want to tell you a story. It's one of the most... Well, it's one of the funniest stories that's happened to me in a long time. It's one of the funniest stories to tell. And one of the most introspective moments that I've had in a long time. I'm driving through the Appalachian Mountains as we speak. I just came off of... Uh, what is it? That there... Uh, Confederate lookout. It's it's one of the best. It's at, it, it may be the best spot in the Appalachians to watch the sunset off of a main road, in my opinion. I've never been there before, but I was sitting there. It was almost 7 o'clock p.m., 
and I said to myself, man, it may be worth sitting here watching this sunset. It may be worth sitting here another hour just to watch this sunset. <laughs> That's how beautiful it was. But I'm racing home. I'm about three hours from home. I'm nearly to West Virginia. And what brought me this far out was the Highland Wildlife Management Area in Virginia. Now these wildlife management areas are, they, they are highly exploratory for me. I mean, they really are. It, I really like coming out and looking these places over, fishing the creeks and rivers, and seeing the land and seeing the opportunity. I'm not too much bothered by the three, this is almost a three hour ride from my house. From Casa de Liberty, I had to drive three hours to get here, and I'll be on a six hour round, round trip now. Now, I wasn't planning on coming home tonight, but we're gonna get to that. <laughs> because that's the punchline. So six hours round trip today by vehicle. Now I spent, let's see, I got here about 10 o'clock, so. I was here for nine hours, and the first, the big bulk of it was spent on the Bull Pasture River fishing for uh, stock trout. They stock brown trout, rainbow, and, and brown trout in the Bull Pasture River. And I was out there with the fly rod, flinging the uh, golden Montana stone fly, and I wasn't getting the job done. And I knew there were fish there. I mean, you look at a, you look at a place like that, and you just know there are fish there. But the water was very deep. Uh, I was having some trouble with my rod, so I, I swapped out for a spinning outfit. And I had an epiphany in that, too. I want to talk to you guys about that. You know, I read an article about the Bull Pasture River before I left to go to go give it the old one, too. And the article was written by a fly fisherman, talked about fly fishing and that sort of thing. And he said, you know, if you get there early enough during the, the early season, sometimes you can get there and have a good day before the spin fishermen show up and spook all the fish. And you know how no matter what you do, there's always a splinter. There's always, a, it's always splintered, right? No matter what you do, it's always splintered. So in other words, I'm a fisherman. Well, okay, but I'm a fly fisherman. Fly fishing is better than spin fishing, right? It's more noble. Looks cool. It's harder. It's, you know what I mean? There's always that splinter. Then within, then within uh, a fly, you can even you can splinter everything. You can split everything into more and more eccentric uh, <laughs> groupings that one can talk down to another from. And I don't really understand that, right? So not only am I a fly fisherman, but I flip fly fish with micro flies, size 18 or better which is a tiny hook. If you've never seen a size 18 hook, you don't know what it is. Next time you're out at Orvis or Bass Pro Shops or something like that, go look at a size 18 hook. I fish only micro flies for finger long brook trout in the mountains. You know, stuff like that. And I started thinking to myself when, my, when I was fly fishing, I said, you know, I should get the spinner out. I, should, I really should. I should go put one of those Berkeley minnows on that my pop got me. My dad gave me this great pack of minnows. I could just, you know, we're just really good at jigging. I mean, just, we can work a bait into an area and it's just, if there's a fish there, I'm gonna get it. You know, I've been doing this thing for years, decades now. And I said, okay, you know, maybe I should. And then, then there was a piece of me that was saying, nah, man. There was a snobby piece of me that was saying, no, look, you drove three hours out here to fish this mountain's pristine limestone river, right? It's blue. The water is blue. I'll, I'll put some pictures up, maybe some videos. The water was blue. It was, it was it's just a beautiful creek, all right? The Bull Pasture River, absolutely gorgeous. And this snobby part of me was like, you can't go spin fishing in here. And I said to myself, why not? Like, what, what the hell is going on in people's minds, in my own mind? that we put these weird barriers up. I only can fly fish here. I really shouldn't be spin fishing here. That's for losers. What do you mean? That's what you do most of the time. I mean, most of the time, really, I get out and I spin fish. That's what I like to do. There's no problem with that. What's wrong with that? Can I reel anything? Can I cast anything? Yeah, sure. But we're out here to have fun, right? God, we get so, you know, it's funny because a lot of people say we live in a time where we only care about fun. But we're so hampered 
by what we think we should be doing instead of what we really want to be. We're so hampered by this that we don't even usually wind up doing what we really like to do or what we really should be doing. We're taking full advantage of the situation at hand. In other words, I probably would have went down that whole bull pasture river and caught nothing. Right? There's a, there's a good chance that I walk that whole river and catch nothing. It's possible. Right? Mountain stone fly. I wasn't getting down to the bottom. The, the river was a lot deeper than I thought it was going to be. And instead, I wised up and said, hey, I'm here to fish. I would like to catch a fish. It's not the only reason I'm here, but I would, wouldn't mind catching a fish. You go get the spinning outfit. Put on the Berkeley. And I, uh, exactly what I couldn't do with the, with the stone fly, I did with with the minnow and within about three casts I had a brown trout on that was big and fat and beautiful orange specks on him like pumpkin orange he had these specks on him just a gorgeous fish uh, I wanted to eat him but I didn't I kept him I filleted him I went to eat him but I left my pan in the car like an idiot so I salted him instead took his fillets off of them and salted them, wrapped them in aluminum foil, and I said, you know what? I'm going to save these for later. Because the plan was to also camp out tonight in the mountains. We're getting closer to the punchline now. <laughs> God, I'm starving. I, it's been a day of granola. It's been a day of granola, but you know what? It's been a day of a lot of learning. I pulled the cated in... Uh, hiker, what is it called? The Hiker Pro or something like that? That's what I carry. That's my water filter of choice. Super easy, highly effective, super fast. That's what I use. I pulled that thing out while I was at the river. I keep a small plastic water bottle. Not plastic. Well, it is plastic, but it's not a plastic water bottle like you would think. This is like a bag water bottle. And I keep this thing wrapped up in my bag for carrying dirty water that's what this thing's job is for you know so if i don't need water it stays in there it stays folded up it doesn't take up any room it's no problem once i get low on water once i get worried about water then i pull this guy out pull the cated in out and i pump it full of good water or pump it full of bad water actually and that has to be boiled and sanitized you know the whole you know the deal cated is flawless though the water can't i mean I have trouble believing I would have died if I drank that water. The Katedin does such a good job. Katedine, I don't know how to say it right. But the Hiker Pro, is in, it's an impeccable water filter. I mean, I don't know what you carry. You might carry a light straw with you. You might carry a Sawyer job. That's fine. I like the Hiker Pro because it is a pump. You know, it's not a straw style. I'm not big into the straw style, the bend down, take a sip deal. You know, I want water that's going to carry. I want volumes of water. Yeah, it's extra weight, but I want it. You know, I don't want to be stuck to a water source if I don't have to be. Also, I want to be able to fill up everybody. You know, if I'm out with, with the family, I want to be able to fill everybody up. Hike, you know, the whole thing. So I did the water thing, sanitized, all the big check marks I hit, you know? So I got food, boom. I got water, boom. Then I started a fire when I got to the campsite. See, I was planning on camping right by the river. And according to the Department of Game and Fish website, you could do that. As soon as I pulled up, there was a big red sign at the, at the footbridge that says, No camping anywhere. <laughs> it was great. My whole trip was thrown in the garbage. I had to go find a new campsite, and I did, luckily. And I found it before about 3 o'clock. I think I got there and got everything unpacked around 3.30. Started with the fire. You know, let's get that going. Went and found a, a down pine tree. I took advantage of that thing. I harvested a bunch off of that. Started processing wood, breaking it down. I, was, I found some great fat wood to start a fire with. Fat wood is... Uh, you guys know what fat wood is? So fat wood is great for starting fire. It's great for starting fire in ugly conditions, which I wasn't really dealing with, but I've been, I've been wanting to mess around with it. And when I saw this down pine tree, I said, oh, this is perfect. This thing was uprooted. I don't know what happened to it, but it was uprooted. 
And I started lopping pieces of it off with my Kershaw Siege, which is just a phenomenal tomahawk. I mean, you can say what you want about tools, about Gerber, but whatever it is. I've used this Kershaw Siege every time I've been out camping. It's like butter through these saplings. It's, it's, it's like butter through small trees, really. I mean, you can't swing it. It's not a two-handed axe. It's le legitimately a tomahawk. And it's so good in the woods. It's unbelievable. You know, it looks like something that uh, you would carry through the zombie apocalypse. It doesn't look like something that you would carry, like a noble bushcrafter would carry into the woods. But I carry it. I don't care. Because A, it's effective, and B, it's a beautiful thing, right? It's got a pry bar built on the bottom of it. It's got this just this devastating spike on the opposite end of the blade. I use that to carry wood sometimes. I just plug that thing into a piece of wood and pull it behind me. I don't know what to tell you. It's a beautiful, it's a piece of equipment that works. So I took down that pine tree. I split and processed all that wood up, and I started scraping out uh, some of that inner bark that's filled with that piney resin you know that piney resin is what just really gets fire going and I use that resin along with some dryer lint which I always bring I mean I think dryer lint is about one of the greatest things that you can have on hand at all <laughs> if you're if you're at all concerned with fire you know I didn't use a lighter but I have a lighter I always have a lighter, but I didn't use a lighter. That's the practice. That's the process, right? You have a lighter, but you don't use it unless you have to. I got the whole campsite set up, the whole thing, right? Everything. Got the sleeping bag in the tent. Every, I had the one-man tent. I was, everything was good. It was great. I was happy, excited. I ate a little bit, drank a little bit. I sat down on some moss. I laid back on some moss. It was very comfortable, and it was early. It was too early to start thinking about bed. It was too early to really enjoy the fire. You know, it wasn't dark enough. But I wanted to get the fire going because I was nervous about temperature. It was supposed to get very cold, 35 degrees, until I saw the sleeping bag. Once I pulled the sleeping bag out, I had hats and gloves and layers. I mean, I wasn't going to be... I probably didn't even need a fire. But I laid there, and I looked up at the sky... You know, and I felt the same feelings that probably everyone feels when they're out in the woods or when they're away from family in general. You know, that idea that... Well, there's several ideas that I feel when I'm out, and I'm going to be open with you. One of them is, I could die tonight. You never know how, but I could die tonight here, alone. It's possible, right? Maniacs, wild animals, very rare, but who knows? I started to think about my boys and my beautiful wife, and I said to myself, what am I doing? And this was the epiphany. This is the punchline. I said to myself, what am I doing out here alone? I mean, here I am. I'm in a relationship for 15 years, right? I've been married to my wife 10 years. I've kept a, a human being alive for six years. One of the coolest kids ever. I've got another two-year-old who's on his way to being one of the coolest kids ever. And I'm sitting here thinking to myself, your foolish ass is about to cuddle up in a one-person tent in 35-degree weather when you have a king-size bed at home with a beautiful woman and two dogs and two kids who can't wait to see you or dying to see you. They're not expecting to see you because you told them you weren't coming home till Sunday. And that was when I said to myself, what do I really like? What am I really doing here? It was a great, it was great practice. All of it was wonderful, great practice that I had to take seriously because I was I was planning on staying the night. Right? I had to have the water, I had to have the everything. But then as the night started to well didn't even the night wasn't even closing in. I mean it was six o'clock, it was still plenty light out. I laid there and I looked up in the sky and I love doing that. It's one of my favorite things. Just lay and look up at the sky. When you're out camping, there's no noise, there's no anything. And just, it, like, it was like a snap, you know what I mean? A snap happened in my head, and that snap, I just said to myself, I'm going home. <laughs> going home. Tent, everything. I got everything set up, everything where it should be. I got breakfast planned in the morning. I had scrambled eggs and bacon. 
going home. Why? Because that's what I want to do. But you spend all this time. But that's what I want to do. I want to drive home. I want to eat a burger and a soda on the way home. I'm going to get home around 9 o'clock. The kids will likely be asleep. But you know what? When we wake up, daddy's home. I don't know what to tell you. You know, this this is just reality. This is just what I want. This is what I like. If you're not doing family, I don't know what the hell you're doing. There's a time... I mean, maybe there'll be a time for this at some point in my life. Maybe there'll be a time for me to be something else. You know, to be... I, I'm not Dave Canterbury. You know what I mean? I don't want to be out in the woods every night. I don't want to be in the... I love the mountains. I don't want to be them every night. I don't want to go out and sleep in the woods alone. But I had to do it to find that out. I usually bring kids, you know. To... You find these things out about yourself and you you have the opportunity. You know, I had the opportunity to sit there and go, you know, just tough it out and get in there and go to sleep. It doesn't make any sense to drive home. No one's expecting you. I said, why? For what? What am I doing? What What am I doing? I'm driving through Churchville now, which is a quaint town. It really is. It is just a quaint little mountain town, and I love to drive through these places, these gift shops. The place has been closed. Are you kidding me? 7 o'clock Saturday night. Mountain town. Letters Place. Oh, Vetter's Place. I'm sorry. Vetter's Place. That's the popular restaurant. They got these big, beautiful houses in these mountain towns that are just unbelievable. And you know what I love? I love the big white church house. God, I love Oh, here we got a daycare center. Oh, God, that made me feel bad. A daycare center in a town like this. That means everyone's everyone's giving the children to someone else to watch. Everyone's doing it. Even in towns like these. Even in towns like these where you run by Confederate flags flying in the air still. They're, they're giving the kids away to early learning and early development. I often wonder what it'd be like to live in a town like this. I think there's a sweet spot in in serious survival of a of a total collapse of civility. I've been thinking about this. I I, re- I think there's a sweet spot, and I think it's suburbia. I'm gonna be honest. I look at these mountain towns. I don't think they'd make it. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. I think the spacing is all wrong. There's a little too much space between neighbors, a little too much to defend, too much to give up, too many opportunities for for people from the outside to come in and take. I'm not a big fan of these far out places. I'm not. When it comes to that, when it comes to, you know, collapse of society, all the walls have come down, the laws are gone, the rules have changed. I think there's a sweet spot and I think it's suburbia. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be honest. Inner city, you're done, right? We all know that. Inner city, you've got very little chance. If you don't escape the inner city quickly in a a serious collapse situation, you're going to be swallowed up in that thing. You're either going to be caught up in that thing or you're going to be swallowed up in that thing. It's not going to be pretty. There's nothing going to be pretty about that. And like I said, far out here, out in these mountain towns, man, I'm, I'm sure there's people who are crazy. I mean, this is where you get your soldiers from. This is where you get your warriors from, these mountain towns, these confederate, these hand-me-downs, or not hand-me-downs, rather, these, 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 these boys who come from the pedigree of the confederacy, really, right? These country guys who've been shooting rifles since they were five. These are the guys who go fight the wars. These are the Chris Kyles of the world and stuff like that. But I don't know, you know, you put them in a, in a military and they're very effective. But can they, how do you protect these houses that are separated by miles? You know, or you quarter, you know, half mile separation between houses and you have about 20 houses to, I don't know. I mean, I guess you could just set up serious perimeters on road or serious barricades on roads and just attack those barricades if someone were to approach aggressively. You know, and just, just make it so no one comes through your town, period. But I don't know. 
I think about suburbia, I think about the possibility that yes, we can build these communities that make sense, we can build these communities that help one another and that make one another better. And of course, the overarching goal of building community, which is one of the four pillars of the I Am Liberty show, right? Powerful communities, healthy Americans, dynamic lifestyles, self-sufficiency, right? That's, that's the four pillars of the I Am Liberty show. That's what holds us up. That's what I believe in. I believe if we put our time and effort into those things, then we're going to live a good life. Simple. But I believe that these powerful communities, the overarching goal obviously is, well, if you have enough people who get along, it's really going to be hard for them to integrate with people who don't get along, right? My community is self-sufficient and we are taking care of one another the best we can type of deal. We don't want to go start trouble with anybody else. We don't want anybody to come start trouble with us. I just think that's the, I think that's the honey hole. I really do. I think that's the most perfect spot is right there in a world where things are tight enough that they can be defended but not so tight that people are living on top of each other and there's no possible way of generating enough resources to feed people in a city. I mean, how do you do that? How do you do that? How do you feed an apartment complex? How do you make an apartment complex responsible for its own food? <laughs> you know what I mean? Even if you talk about rooftop gardening and things like that, how much, how much weight can you put on, how much soil can you put on a rooftop before it collapses? And how much food can you harvest from a rooftop? Look, these are philosophical questions that you think about when you've spent 10 hours, 12, what, well, how long? 12 hours almost out here? By yourself, casting into pristine waters, hiking, searching for a great campsite, doing everything that, a, that someone would do in order to camp out and then deciding to hell with it, I'm going home. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful to me. I don't know why. It's just funny. It's just funny. I really hope that you guys listen to my show and I hope that you take the same exploratory sort of path that I take to life. I mean, it's important. It's important. It really is important to know that, you know what? Don't take anything so seriously. Don't do it. Don't you dare take anything so seriously that you don't know how to, how to have a good time anymore. I mean, these are important things to understand. You have to understand these things about yourself easily take yourself too crazily seriously. I have to. I must. What are the things that you really must do in life, you know? Well, listen. I gotta get something to eat. I'm gonna grab myself a bite, and I'll be back with some more of the I Am Liberty show. Okay, okay, what am I supposed to care about now? Bill Cosby, uh, immigrant, legal immigrants at the southern border, as usual. What, what else? My sister sent me a great, a great tweet about Bill Cosby and Meek Mill and sort of the, you know, the, the difference between the two. And the tweet was funny because my sister's funny. But... And it's none of your business why it was funny, but it was funny. But the funnier part about it was, it was a very short tweet. It was about two sentences long. And I said, you know what? That's, that's enough. That's perfect. Right there. Two sentence statement on this story is all America needs. That's it. There's a problem. We all have a problem. We all have a problem we need to rein in. We're addicted to information. We're addicted to information and it makes... It makes those things that matter disappear. It makes those stories that should be the stories of the century. They disappear behind Bill Cosby. They disappear behind... Behind... Uh, what, what else? What are these... Stormy Daniels type news segments that... They don't matter. That's why good news can never get traction, right? 
So what I'm trying to tell you is the age of the Great Awakening, the informational Great Awakening, has given way to this... It's a, it's a backflow. It's a muddy world full of stories and full of memes and full of photos and full of... Well, it's basically white noise. Right? The, what was the quote by Thoreau? The mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. I think that's still true, and I think it's a great quote. And I think it explains a lot of things, like the maniac in Toronto who drove... Uh, you know, ran people over a la Muslim style. When you, you, you know, I, I, you think the guy's a Muslim, right? You're like, okay, well, truck drives people over. Turns out he's part of a group called uh, involuntar- involuntarily celibate or something like that. Insul. This group of dudes who cannot get laid. These group of guys who can't get it together and find the woman, or, or which I think is the case more often. Uh, are unwilling to deal with the rejection that goes along with approaching women that men have dealt with forever. But we're so we're so soft a society now that men can't even deal with the, with the. And I know this to be true because I knew men like this, who were nearly in, who were nearly on the verge of giving up on women because they couldn't deal with the rejection. They couldn't deal with the idea that I'm going to go ask this girl for a drink. I'm going to go ask this girl to dance. I'm going to go ask this girl for something. And there's a 90% chance she's going to reject me. Now, men who are married understand rejection. (laughs) And they master it. Right? That's, That's sometimes part of marriage. You know, if you... I don't know how to go into this topic appropriately. You have to be able to toe the line between rejection and, uh, what is it? An undying will to get what you want. (laughs) And that happens in all phases of life. I mean, that happens on a weekly basis I face that. I face it in my business, right? I email a company. I tell them, look, this is what I can do for you. They email me back. Sorry, sir, uh, we don't have the budget right now. Okay, I email them back. Well, look, this plan is fully customizable. What would you like to add? What would you like to take away? Oh, I don't know about it, sir. It doesn't seem like something. Well, look, let me do something little for you first. I mean, that's life. That's life. You See, this is what drives me crazy about guys. You see a woman across the room, she's the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. Oh my God, look at her, man. God, she's beautiful, gorgeous. I'm going to go talk to her. Okay, cool, go talk to her. Come back, tail between the legs. Uh, Yeah, she she rejected me. She said she wasn't interested. Okay. What's next? (laughs) What's next? Is that it? If the whole of humanity was left up to you, we'd be extinct, my man. We would be extinct. I'm just going to let that... That's just going to be it. That's going to be the end. So a whole a whole group of these guys who, who can't get laid and, and can't deal with rejection and can't figure out how to get one woman in, in a world of, God, how many billion to like them? Well, they formed a group called Insul or Cecil or Winsel or Finsel. I don't know what they're called. Involuntarily, involuntarily celibate men. Involuntarily celibate. What's that mean? To me, that sounds like you're just not working hard enough, dude. Come on. Now listen. I'd be lying if I said I understand their plight or I ever understood their plight. I never had a problem with women ever. From the time I was six, I never had problem. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just not one of those things I ever had to deal with handsome but anyway all these stories back to the main point all these stories you run them over with the truck you blow them up you, you, you the IRA and the <laughs> the IRA and the Yeti battle where the people are blowing their Yeti coolers up I mean is there a better story in the world but how much time does that you don't know that story do you know the story it's a tremendous story 
So the Yeti Cooler Company and the NRA get into a little scuffle. Nothing big, right? But the NRA makes a big stink about it. You know, probably because they're pissed because everyone's on their ass constantly. And these people, these NRA members, you know, the dyed in the wool, the true NRA members, the real, the real deal, they start blowing... <laughs> They start filling their Yeti coolers up with explosives and blowing them up. Yeah, that'll show them. That'll show <laughs> That'll show them. Listen, you already forgot about what I told you. You already forgot about the four stories I told you. Right? That's the problem. That's what's tough. That's where the human needs to self-regulate. What story... What stories deserve my time, which don't deserve my time? Which stories, most importantly now, which stories do I act on? Right? What do I act on? What do I spend my precious time on? Is there a story here that needs more of my time? For example, peace in Korea. It's a big story. It's a great story. It's one worth sitting on. It's one worth reading several articles about. It's peace in the modern world. In a place where we haven't seen peace in over 60, what, 70 years? Oh, look, the fireworks at the diamond. Look at that. I'm almost home. They've got fireworks going off over at the diamond. Beautiful. Welcoming me home. But the understanding of what's going into your head is massive. It's huge. It's, it's, it, it, it limits your ability to concentrate on the things that matter. It also limits your ability to be effective. You know? There's going to come a time... It's going to be the uh, like the great disconnect. The great disconnect is going to be the time when people realize that they can't focus on it all. They can't be who they want to be. They can't do what they want to do. Because of the Drudge Report. Because of Huffington Post. Because of Bloomberg. Because of Forbes. Because of every single time they turn around there's a new story that everyone's talking about and everyone's telling them you have to hear about this story listen to me you've got to regulate you've got to self-regulate if i were you this is what i would i can't really self-regulate i'm giving you uh examples of things you should do but i can't do because i'm a writer and my jo- one of my jobs as a writer is to, to, to know what's going on. Then I got to get on and broadcast on top of it, right? So like the broadcast too, so I got to know the, all the news that's fit to print. But anyway, if you want to be effective, I'm telling you, you got to self-regulate. And trust me, when I'm on my days off, I don't even look at these websites. Like today, I haven't I haven't looked at a news website the whole day. For what? What are they going to tell me on a Saturday? Are they going to really, really, is it really going to change my life to go look at the Yahoo uh, trending news? The trending news on Twitter, is that really going to make my life any better? No. Not going to make, and what would really be nice, the news story I'd like to read is that we're pulling, uh, what, the several hundred million dollars out of Syria that we're using to fund the rebels... We're pooling the, what, 100 million or so, maybe more dollars that we give to Israel every year. We're pooling this money in, back into the United States, and funneling it into, uh, oh, what? How many different things could we funnel that money into? Or, maybe we just pull it back and don't spend it, so that we're not spending $4 trillion a year. $4 trillion a year. That is not a made-up number. I heard it from a congressman today when I was cruising down the back roads of Appalachia. I heard $4 trillion a year. We're $800 billion behind the eight ball just this year. $800 billion behind the... So we're $800 billion in debt. We're running a budget that is short $800 billion. Meanwhile, we're funding... Well... We're funding Syrian rebels. I think we could probably pull some of that money back. What do, you, <laughs> what do you think? Do we need to keep Israel afloat for the rest of their existence? What's the deal here? What is the deal here? 
I don't want to go down the list of the litany of things I would do with that money because that's a whole other show. But what am I even getting at? What am I even getting at? Listen, as we usher in this new age that we're seeing take form before our eyes, the technological overlord <laughs> that's, that is whatever this thing is mutating into, right? The phone is like Stone Age technology compared to what's coming. And it's going to be all encompassing the technology. It's going to take a hold of you and it's never going to let go. And you're not going to be able to get out. Unless you have the self-control. Unless you have the willpower. Unless you have somebody who, who who's raised you your whole life or you're raising someone their whole life and telling them, look, make sure that you don't forget about the real world. I don't know. It's been a long day. It's been a long day. I'm just glad to have you guys here with me. Go to the website, IamLibertyShow.com. Follow me at I am Liberty Show on Twitter. Uh, if you want to watch some videos, you, or you can listen to the podcasts at YouTube. Other than that, have yourselves a Merry Christmas. I'm out of here. Yeah.